Army presents The Big Picture. An official report produced for the armed forces and the American people. The highly mobile, hard-hitting tools of warfare you've just seen in action are a small representative sample of the kind of equipment and troops required for America's modern army. Military power is now, and will be for some time to come, the most effective deterrent to aggression. In a recent speech, Lieutenant General Arthur G. Trudeau, chief of your Army's research and development program, said this about the threat which faces us. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, this country is still the prime target of an endless and all-out offensive by world communism. The communists engage us on every front and by every means at their disposal, short of military action. Their strategy includes a powerful military posture, subversion, economic warfare, and a massive propaganda machine geared to the exploitation of dramatic technological accomplishments. Let us make no mistake about it. We are going to continue to be the targets for such attacks. Today on The Big Picture, you will see some of what the communists have been doing and are doing in their bid for world military supremacy. You will also see some of the countermeasures now being taken by your army so that in the balance of world military power, our nation's forces can continue to be a powerfully effective deterrent to aggression. Since the end of World War II, the Army of the Soviet Union has been rebuilding, re-equipping with a completely new arsenal of weapons. Its strength today stands at approximately two and a half million men, all well-trained and well-armed. Combining these with satellite troops and allies like Red China, the communist states have a seven million man army. Never in peacetime history have the demands on the United States Army been greater than they are today. Demands for the army to fulfill its mission as a deterrent to aggression. In the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, we're linked with one of our closest neighbors, Canada. From Canada, the membership extends into the Atlantic to Iceland, then across the sea to the United Kingdom. From the UK to Norway, then across the Baltic Strait to Denmark. Next, the Independent Republic of West Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg to France and Portugal and Italy. From Italy to Greece and finally to Turkey. From NATO, we move to CETO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. With France and the UK, we're linked with Pakistan, with Thailand in Southeast Asia with the Republic of the Philippines off the Asian mainland. And in the Southern Pacific with Australia and neighboring New Zealand. Other bilateral agreements have been made throughout the world, a security pact with Japan. We have a military aid and defense treaty with the Republic of South Korea. Another agreement links us with free Chinese forces on Formosa. And the USA-Brazil pact was the first in a series of agreements with the countries of Latin America. 
Maintaining strong combat-ready forces overseas is one of the Army's missions in deterring aggression. Our 7th Army is in Germany. Here, it's a combat-ready part of the defense forces of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The very presence of the 7th Army assures our allies in NATO that we are ready to back up our promises of defense aid. The 7th Army is a force on guard to hold the line if necessary until reinforcements can be brought up to the front in Central Europe. South of the Alps, in Italy today, is another overseas frontline outfit, the Southern European Task Force. CTAF. CTAF's supply headquarters are located near Leghorn, 250 miles south of the main installation, which lies in the shadow of the Alps. Because of the size of its main weapons, CTAF's supply requirements are enormous. CTAF is fundamentally a fire support unit. It's organized around weapons which have both conventional and atomic capabilities. CTAF is designed to support the regular forces of our NATO allies in Europe, which might not have such a force of their own. This task force is organized for easy dispersion and great mobility. CTAF's ground-to-ground -ground missiles are ready day and night to strike hard and fast at any aggressor's challenge. These missiles combine a high degree of accuracy with tremendous destructive potential. In the hands of CTAF specialists, they represent a formidable danger to any would-be aggressor in the area of CTAF's operations. With only about 6,000 men, CTAF is a relatively small force, but what it lacks in number, it makes up in firepower. Guarding the front line in Korea is a third major army overseas combat force, the United States 8th Army. Men of the 8th, with other United Nations troops, patrol the demilitarized zone which splits the Korean Peninsula. Although Chinese Communist forces are being withdrawn from North Korea, they remain within easy striking distance of the UN forces. As a result, the men of the 8th Army must continue to be alert to the possibility of renewed Communist aggression. Backing up the army troops on the mainland of Asia are supporting elements stationed on offshore islands. On Okinawa, the U.S. Army Rukyu's Islands, 9th Corps guards this important outpost in the Far East. Simulated invasions keep the men of the 9th Corps on their toes against the threat of the real thing, for an attack on Okinawa would endanger our vital Pacific lifeline. Closer to home is the Army's 25th Infantry Division in our 50th state, Hawaii. The 25th is stationed at Schofield Barracks on the outskirts of Honolulu. Its operations are directed from Fort Shafter, the headquarters of the United States Army in the Pacific. Members of the 25th are strategically located reserves who are ready to move with their equipment to any trouble spot that may erupt on the periphery of the communist empire in the Orient. In Asia, as in Europe, the Army's mission is to deter aggression. The Army's presence in overseas areas represents a major obstacle to any aggressor. Headquarters of the United States Army Caribbean is in the Panama Canal Zone. For the past 45 years, the Panama Canal has been one of the most important facilities in the United States Defense Organization. Keeping the canal open to ships of our Navy is imperative if the Navy is to fulfill its mission in our three service defense program. At the Zone's Jungle Warfare Training Center, crack troops learn the fundamentals of living and fighting in dense jungle. Because of unrest in various Central and South American countries, the importance of the Canal Zone's defenders has greatly increased in recent months. 
the broad mission of the United States Army, Alaska, is to plan, provide and take part in the ground and air defense of our 49th state. Long-range patrols are carried out summer and winter alike by combat units stationed here. While conducted primarily for training purposes, these patrols have become the most reliable and often the only source of information concerning remote regions of the new state. Regularly scheduled maneuvers provide realistic training for men in this command. These maneuvers also test the combat readiness of the troops and give commanders a chance to examine their plans of defense and counterattack under artificial combat conditions. Because of its proximity to the Soviet Union, there is little doubt of the importance of the job being done by the men manning our northern ramparts. Helping also to fulfill the Army's mission is the Strategic Army Corps stationed in the continental United States. Strack elements, such as the 101st and the 82nd Airborne Divisions, demonstrate in the Cold War that our Army has backup strength, ready to reinforce our overseas troops should a conflict break out anywhere in the world. Speed, mobility, firepower and versatility are key concepts behind the new look of the Army's Strack forces. Fast-moving, highly skilled infantrymen are part of the Army's answer to the pressing military demands of today when wars may break out with little or no warning anywhere in the world. Wars requiring the speedy deployment of major United States Army forces. Fundamental to the effectiveness of these fire brigade forces is the training of foot soldiers who can fight in independent actions in small groups who can accomplish their mission swiftly and then move on fast to where their presence may be needed next. With the battlefield of the future covering much larger areas than heretofore, the winning army, which must of necessity be large in size, must avoid mass formations and will have to move men and equipment much faster and more efficiently than the enemy. Yet another mission of the army is to train replacements, men to take the place of those who complete their terms of military service men to fill the ranks of divisions, which would have to be readied if strack were committed, and men to cadre new divisions if mobilization were required. These near-ready divisions represent backup strength for combat-ready divisions. Although there are a host of revolutionary new weapons, the recruit must be taught the fundamentals of conventional ground warfare, which apply whether a conflict be atomic or non-atomic. Still another of the Army's many missions as a deterrent to aggression is its contribution to the nation's air defense. Encircling the cities of America with rings of steel are scores of Nike Ajax battalions. These anti-aircraft defenses are manned around the clock, seven days a week, day or night, the crews are ready to respond to the slightest threat. And replacing the Nike Ajax in the air defense units of the Army today is the larger, longer range, faster flying Nike Hercules, which is capable of delivering an atomic warhead against enemy air armada. Today is in the past. Great reliance is put on the Army reserve components the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve for standby reinforcing military strength. The Army is continuing its efforts to enable these units to attain a far higher standard of peacetime readiness than ever before.
the Army's training job goes far beyond the teaching of American troops alone. In 44 countries around the globe, our Army has military assistance advisory groups, which help to train the soldiers of allied and friendly nations. Our military and economic aid program is designed to help friendly governments resist communist encroachment. It also follows in the best American tradition of helping other peoples to improve their lot. Recently, our NATO allies have invested approximately five of their own dollars in defense for every one offered by the United States. Our military assistance helps to create security and confidence among our allies. The aid which the United States Army gives to friendly foreign military forces is one of our main sources of deterrent strength. The Army's mission is to help improve the effectiveness of the armies of allies whose combined strength represents the equivalent of some 200 divisions. Nearly 7,000 men of our army are assigned to MAG posts. They are sent to friendly countries to train foreign forces in the use of U.S. military equipment. In addition to the 44 MAG installations, the army has military missions in 19 countries which are initiated by the countries themselves when a specific military problem arises. These missions are paid for by the nation which receives our aid. In developing the strength of our allies, the Army helps them to resist the inroads of communism. In so doing, a significant contribution is made to the overall security of the United States. In some instances, as here in Korea, the assistants and advisory groups help to heal the wounds and to build up the defensive vigor of countries which have already suffered communist aggression. Another form of our military assistance program is the training of allied military personnel in the United States. This year, about 7,000 soldiers from over 60 allied countries will receive special training in the United States Army Service Schools. Planning and directing the many missions of the Army are the administrators in the Pentagon. Here is the command post for the defense activities of the Army profoundly affecting the security of all the free nations of the world, directing American soldiers in 77 foreign lands. An example of Army assistance to the sister services is logistical support of the distant early warning radar network, which stretches from the Pacific to the Atlantic through northern Canada. The Dew Line provides early warning information for the North American Air Defense Command, a combined Canadian-United States command involving Army, Navy, and Air Force units. Today, more than ever, the Army's future strength depends on the results of research and development. Ranging far into the future, Army researchers are making spectacular advances in many different fields. Accomplishments to date have been varied and impressive in rockets and missiles. Little John all-weather rocket. La Crosse, a highly accurate field artillery missile for tactical support. Reliable Honest John. The three-ton medium-range rocket. Corporal, the first real field army support weapon. Redstone, capable of delivering atomic warheads up to 200 miles. And surface to air, the Hawk, which operates in the blind zone of conventional radar systems. Nike Ajax, long a mainstay of air defense, forerunner of Hercules. Nike Hercules, with either conventional or nuclear warheads, the most powerful air defense weapon known.
and in development, Nike Zeus, the Army's anti-missile missile. Making the infantryman a harder-hitting individual are new small arms like the M60 machine gun, which is replacing the old heavy and light machine guns. It possesses a higher rate of fire and can be fired from bipod, tripod, or handheld. Firing the standard 762 NATO cartridge, the new M14 rifle is fired full or semi-automatic. It's a truly versatile rifle which will do much towards streamlining the fighting capabilities of our infantrymen. Soon the M14 will replace four of the Army's handheld weapons. New helicopters like the Iroquois and the Shawnee will give greater tactical mobility to the men of our reorganized pentomic divisions. Revolutionary advances are being made in fixed wing planes for transport, supply and surveillance. Experiments with short and vertical takeoff and landing aerial vehicles are being carried out under a broad program to provide much greater speed and mobility for the foot soldier. The atom bomb, of course, has changed the complexion of all military strategy and planning. And as part of its evolution, the Army has faced up to the new responsibility of training its forces for nuclear as well as conventional warfare. Communist aggressiveness, whether outright attack, subversion, or agitation, has worn many guises in the past. Only a strong, combat-ready army can give pause to a militant nation bent on further expansion. Following a revolution in Iraq in the summer of 1958, the government of neighboring Lebanon requested military assistance from the United States. The Lebanese army had failed to quell a rebellion which had been going on for several months and radio propaganda from Moscow, Cairo and Damascus led the government to believe its sovereignty was in jeopardy because of the bloodbath in Iraq. Under the Eisenhower doctrine, Lebanese President Shamoun asked for American aid. Members of an army airborne battle group of the 24th Division were airlifted from Germany to Beirut. With members of the Marine Corps from the Navy's 6th Fleet, the Army set about securing the Beirut airport and establishing law and order in the capital city and environs. Such swift and timely action on the part of the United States Armed Forces contributed much toward bringing peace to Lebanon and stability in the Middle East as a whole. Lebanon is but one example of nearly a score of crises since World War II, which clearly demonstrates the need for the capability of moving troops fast and smoothly from one part of the world to another when a small conflict suddenly threatens to explode into a war of giant proportions. In trying to improve its mobility and firepower, our army is constantly testing new techniques to boost its maneuverability and increase the impact of its fighting punch. Helicopters have already proved their value in moving infantrymen into battle areas fast. Today, armed experimental helicopters presage things to come, the flying tanks and personnel carriers of tomorrow. In carrying out its mission in the training, deployment and redeployment of our combat troops as constantly changing international conditions demand, Army planners and strategists today are aware of the fact that communist leaders are not idle, that they too are working to improve their military machines, are investing all the skills, intelligence and manpower which a totalitarian state commands in the construction of a fighting force which will not only equal but surpass those of the free nations of the world.
the complexion of future battles will demand that our army forces be highly mobile if its increased destructive firepower is to be used effectively. Speed, punch, dispersion, and mobility. These are the key words in today's army, and to a greater degree the necessity of the army of tomorrow. History has shown that time and time again, major conflicts are usually preceded by periods when an aggressor either chants phrases of peace or chews away slowly at weaker neighbors. To relax our guard or ease our military strength is to invite disaster. The lands under communist rule stretch from Central Europe to the East Rim of Asia. These lands represent more than one quarter of the world's surface. Their peoples represent more than a third of the world's population. While the Soviet Union continues to make rapid strides in conquering space, it has not turned away from the idea of controlling the world. Its standing army is second in size only to that of the Red Chinese. In the intensive training it gives its soldiers, it's second to none. If the United States is to contain the ambitions of the communist world in the future, our army must be ready to fight under any and all conditions. In times of crisis, America has always produced men with the courage and convictions to fulfill the Army's mission, to meet the enemy and to overcome him face to face. This era of atoms and missiles does not mark any decline in the value of ground troops, nor does it produce any doubt that in a future war, large or small, the final decision will lie in the hands of the men who are able to defend their own land and to take and hold the enemy's territory. All the military services are working together to develop the strength necessary to deter war or to be victorious should our deterrent efforts fail. As its part in our total defense effort, our army maintains strong combat ready forces overseas and strategic forces at home ready to respond to local aggression anywhere in the world or to reinforce our overseas deployment in case of general war. It provides anti-aircraft units for the air defense of the United States and trained reserve forces capable of rapid mobilization. And by continuing to develop the ground forces of our allies around the world, it seeks to discourage aggression by a unified show of strength, by making clear our determination to defend the rights of free men everywhere, now and always. The big picture is an official report for the armed forces and the American people. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the Department of the Army in cooperation with this station.